As we consider the phenomenon of artificial intelligence here at the Computer History Museum and its meaning today and for the future, it's entirely appropriate that we begin with two historic names in the field of computing, Alan Turing and John McCarthy. Next year is the centennial of the birth of the brilliant British mathematician Turing. It's a centennial, by the way, that we will be marking as part of our revolutionary series. 51 years ago, just 51 years ago, a blink of an eye in the span of human history, Alan Turing published his famous essay entitled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. It began with a very famous sentence. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? He predicted that someday they would, or at least they would behave in such a way that we would and understand them to be at least giving us the appearance of human thought. John McCarthy, the legend at Stanford, a researcher, a scientist, and a museum fellow, coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. His accomplishments in the field are really too numerous for me to mention tonight, uh, but in the spirit of machines like Watson that play games and beat humans, we remember John McCarthy in part for writing the Lisp programming language and also for being a pioneer of computer chess. We have an entire gallery downstairs devoted to that work, artificial intelligence and robotics. We also have a gallery devoted entirely to computer chess. AI in Revolution includes a great film on Turing, on McCarthy, on museum trustee at Feigenbaum, the Dendril Project, and knowledge-based computing, and much, much more. So, in short, we are, as an institution, somewhat fixated on the history and the promise and the future of AI. So it's entirely fitting tonight that we should welcome Dr. David Ferrucci of IBM and the FT's West Coast correspondent, Richard Waters, for a conversation about the genesis of Watson and as many of its implications as we can cover in one evening. I think you're going to be fascinated with David's story of how Watson came to be, how it works, uh, and if he's willing to talk about it, uh, how Watson is finding real-world important applications beyond the entertaining pursuit of humiliating humans playing Jeopardy. <laughs> and then, of course, we'll get to watch that very thing happen right here on the stage uh, after that conversation. So let me please remind you that you have question cards on your chairs. Please pass the question cards to the end of the row. We'll collect those at the top of the hour. We'll pass those up to Richard. We want to hear from you and the things that you would most like to hear from him. So please, uh, without uh, any further introduction, welcome the FT's Richard Waters and Dr. David Ferrucci of IBM. Well, John, thank you for that introduction. And uh, I'm rooting for the humans tonight, by the way. I got a feeling. I just got that feeling. It's a tremendous privilege to be here, welcome you all, and uh, to introduce Dave Ferrucci. Um, not many of you will know this, but Dave was actually destined for a completely different career as a doctor, as That's a right. doctor of medicine rather than a doctor of computer That's science. That's right, a real, a real doctor. Right? A real doctor. <laughs> and uh, brought up in the Bronx, and he was, uh, he tells me he was heading for, he, in fact, he, was, he got as far as his MCATs, and the light bulb went off over his head, and he realized, you know, this was not the thing to do. And he actually got up in, in, in the middle of that exam. Yeah, well, this is, paper this is the, in. yeah, the, um, the exam that you would take to prepare for the, for the MCATs, right. and, and it was in a preparation course. And, uh, you know, I just, I had been got, getting so and so enamored by computers and the potential, and frankly, about artificial intelligence um, ever since I was introduced to them in high school. But I was on that course to become a medical doctor. And uh, this is what my parents wanted me to do, and this is what it was like programmed in my brain. And, but little by little, I just got more and more fascinated by AI, by programming. I would stay up all night programming my, uh, I guess it was an Apple, Apple IIe or something, um, you know, all night long. And uh, so here I am, you know, on this course, in this, uh, taking the, the, the MCAT preparation thing. And um, I opened it up, and I think it was an organic chemistry exam I had to take for the next 45 minutes. And I sat there and I said, you know what? I'm not going to be a doctor. And I just closed the book. And I went up to the proctor and I handed it in. And uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm not going to be a medical doctor. He said, yeah, whatever. You still owe me the $500 oh. for the course. <laughs> and then you, so Dave, now look, I'm still doing my introduction here. So oh, sorry. Go, yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> you so were taking you became, too long. So, so you became an inorganic man at that <laughs> I moment. became inorganic. Completely inorganic. So from that moment, as you say, it was, it was AI. The AI light, light bulb went off right. at a very early age. And so uh, 
you then went on to Rensselaer, which I think is the uh, the oldest engineering school in the U.S. That's right. Yeah. Uh, M.A. Ph.D. A career at IBM, where you came and went two or three times in research, and really your career has uh, in research followed or mirrored the trajectory of AI in its early days. I think uh, you know expert systems you worked on when they were the big thing in the 80s. Right. Um, then there was the the AI winter. That's you know, right. And uh, the lights went out, and everybody thought, you know, this is this is not really heading anywhere. Right. And then back to IBM right. uh, in the mid 90s um, to get back onto this trajectory, which has brought us here tonight to uh, this wonderful demonstration of uh, where computing power has got to. But let's um, you know, let's go back to that maybe that that uh, mid 90s point, if you like, and uh, maybe start with where artificial intelligence had got to at that point. Because as John Hollower said at the beginning, uh, it started out with such amazing hope and expectation in the mid 50s, late 50s, and then by the early 60s, I think everybody assumed that within a, within a decade we'd have talking computers. Uh, and it didn't happen. No. But what went wrong? Were the expectations wrong? Did the technology not evolve? I, I think the expectations were way off. I, I, I think, um we really, at the time, the industry sort of had no, no deep appreciation for how miraculous the human brain is, frankly. Um, I think that, you know, what, what, I think what inspired me back in high school when I was first introduced to computers was the same thread that inspired many of the AI scientists at the time, which was, you can, you can sit down at this machine, you can imagine a procedure or a process and you can encode that procedure, say, you know, do this, then do this, then do this, and the computer would do it. And so the immediate sort of next thought was, well, gee, if I can um, reason and I can be conscious about how I reason, you know, I have rules like if this happens, then do this, and if that happens, then do this, and I have the power of this computer in front of me, it's going to be, it won't be long before I can just give it all these rules and it's just going to take off and it's going to work, you know, it's going to do what the human mind does. But that was uh, sort of grossly off the mark. I think the way the human mind works and the, made, the way it encodes knowledge and the way it reasons is just far more complicated and far more mysterious than, than was originally imagined. So it was a failure to conceive the complexity of the human mind rather than uh, an overestimation of the technology back then. Well, I think I, I think I think I think that's well, fair. I mean, I, I I think that's probably the right way to think about it. Um, I think it's a little bit of both, yeah. but that I mean, the field of artificial intelligence is still dominated by this, you know, this thing, the Turing test, the idea that uh, the end the end goal, in a way, is when a when a machine can appear to be like a human. And so Alan Turing set that test early on as a as a as a sort of um, you know, the real proof point. Was that, is, is that just the wrong trajectory? And were people thinking um, that, you know, uh, were they heading off in the wrong direction from the beginning? Well, I, th I think the Turing test is an inspirational test. I think it's still around, I, I, and it still means something, which is, is the, is the computer behaving in a way that, um, that is so human-like I, I, it's hard for me to tell. I can't tell the, tell the difference whether I'm interacting with a human or, or I'm interacting with a machine. And I think it sets a very, very tough goal. But I also think um, it's a little bit troublesome because, because of how general it is. Right? If we think of it a task by task, it, it's very different. So you know, uh, when we think about how McCarthy defined artificial intelligence, so you know, a program is artificially intelligent if it performs a task, and if that task were performed by a human, we would consider the human intelligent. So it's, it's a task-specific definition. So when you know, Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov, we thought, well, as far as chess goes, this computer is performing uh, you know, at a human level. It's doing what a champion you know, human could do uh, at chess. So when we see Watson play Jeopardy, we're saying you know, Watson is performing like a human at the game of, of Jeopardy. Uh, but, you know, can Watson sit down and have this conversation? No. Can Watson, you know, tell, tell jokes? No. Watson, in fact, can't play chess unless it calls its cousin Deep Blue. But, um, <laughs> right, so you, but you, human you, you, en you end up with a very task-specific mm -hmm. perspective, whereas uh, the Turing test is usually open, right? It says, 
you know, can you interact with this machine and get, would you believe it's human? Well, we, we, we expect a lot more from humans than just to do these well, specific tasks. But to go back to when you got into this field in the 80s, expert systems were based on this idea that you could reduce everything to a set of rules right. and that if you could only learn all the rules and cram all the data in, then you would have a machine that would turn out right. the perfect answer. Right. Didn't work. No, it, it did. I mean, so it worked no. to a degree, oh. right? Because if you can, if you can encode the rules, you could say, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you see a circular red rash, you know, and the person's visited Connecticut, you know, and this and that, then they have Lyme disease or something. Um, okay, that was one rule. <laughs> You've got another billion to go, right? So, um, and by the way, by the time you're done, there'll be ten times more information, and you could you could start again, All right? So this this you know so. If the domain was limited, the number of rules you needed to encode was limited, uh, the way you would interact with the computer was directly connected to the way you express those rules, then you could get it to do, you know, do impressive things. But when you had to really deal with information the way humans do, which is much more broad, much more generally, much more flexibly, it wasn't, it wasn't working. No. And, and I, I'm sorry. So, so, so um, this sets up this, the, the real um, hard part of, a, of AI, which is how do we get computers to understand things in human terms and you know, human language? So something that can't be reduced uh, to uh, well-defined mathematics. And, and chess, uh, chess, chess and understanding human language frame this problem, I think, nicely because um, when we think about chess, Chess is this mathematically well-defined problem, right? A certain number of you know pieces as a finite grid. Each piece has an you know exact mathematically well-defined you know move you know, pattern in which it can move on the grid. And you could imagine now a computer can follow those rules, move those pieces around, and say, "Did I win yet? All right, let me try some other moves. Did I win yet? Let me try some other moves." So now, if you can make this computer pow powerful enough to search that big space, try many, many different moves and evaluate all these board configurations, it can start to do really well at chess. There's no ambiguity, there's no implicit, there's no confusion, there's no tacit information. It doesn't have to have any other background knowledge to play, to play, the, play mm -hmm. the game. So when I sit there and look at that, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because I stick at chess, but when I step back and look at that, I think it's a marvel that humans can play chess, not that computers can. So chess is a machine function. That's yeah, not I mean, enough I, to I, use I, in the market. That, that's that's why I look at it. But, yeah. but now, when you get yeah. into um, understanding human language, now, now you're, you're out of the element for the machine. You're into the human element. Well, let's, well so, so before we get on to that, let's, let's then talk about what happened after 95. So you came back to IBM right. uh, in Westchester, uh, in the Watson Labs, to... Yes. Uh, pursue this, and, and the field was starting to open up again. What, what, what uh, new areas of research did you see that was starting to develop that gave you the confidence to think that you could move beyond where things had got stuck before? What, what were the strands? Well, you know, so I got involved in software architecture and engineering, which I think, you know, because I just liked to do it. In fact, you know, it's interesting, when you, when you think about these classic, you know, expert systems, where you would write all these rules down, you sort of model the world. Um, you'd say, you know, there's this kind of concept, and there's people, there's places, there's time, people move, and you'd start to build this big model of how things worked in the world. This was fun to do, you know, for, for, for a person, you know, I was sort of a logician, I like logic, I like modeling things, I like breaking things down into their subcomponents. This was a lot of fun to do um, for someone of my ilk, anyway. And, not generally fun. My kids would hate it. But anyway, so it was fun. Um, but you started to realize it was, very, it was very, sort of very limited it was because it, I was never going to be able to model everything and things were constantly changing. And so what I started to get more and more interested in was uh, methods and techniques for getting the computer to try to digest knowledge in the form that humans created it, right, which is language. It's, it's not just um, natural language that we speak in, but uh, images, you know, speech, text, you know, right? So language. Um, language is uniquely um, a human artifact. Right? We create it to communicate with one another. And it's extraordinary in its efficiency 
largely because we have a shared uh, experience, of a shared con an experience. So when I start speaking with you, you start nodding, you're understanding me, you're using a lot of background information to get that. If you had a very limited experience with different usage of those words, we wouldn't really be able to communicate at all because the, unlike chess, there's not a, a specific meaning that we've all agreed to for every single word. It's about usage. I mean, one of the, the stories I like to tell is, um, is that I had two young daughters and a, a very common experience in the Frucci household would be me yelling down to my daughters, you guys gotta come down here, this is really, really interesting. And I'd be, you know, doing some experiment in the sink or, you know, doing something crazy that trying to stimulate them and excite them about science. You guys gotta come down here, it's really, really interesting. And so this was the, a common use as they were growing up with the word interesting. And at when uh, one of my kids was uh, seven years old, she stopped at the top of the stairs when I was yelling out, come down here, it's really interesting. And she said, Daddy, interesting things are boring. <laughs> and um, she, wasn't, she, she wasn't making a joke, right? This was not a joke. This was an assertion. Right, because this was the, the, so every time she heard this word interesting, at least the most frequent and loudest times, was her association with that was a, the feeling of boredom. So, so, so language has rules, but the rules change depending on the context, and the humans make it's, up it's, the context it's con as they it's, go. It's, it's, exactly, it's, com it's contextual, it's extremely flexible. Mm. A great example of, context, uh, of meaning being revealed as, uh, as um, or I should say sort of, getting more and more co uh, concrete as context comes in, right? So if I say to you, um, so the bat came flying through the window. So you're, you're, you're forming a, me a mental image. I'm thinking of a cricket bat because I'm British, but I understand what you you're thinking. Well, yeah. someone else out there is right. thinking about a, a, a you know, fruit bat, right? Mm -hmm. a, a, you know, some flying creature, right, flew through the window. But then, you know, but then I say to you, um, and then Johnny came running home. Right now, the probability is of what bat is sort of changing. What can it be now? Um, is it could still be, could Johnny maybe was running because he was scared of the fruit bat chasing him, or maybe he was running to home base, you know, in a, in a game of baseball, and and you know, and 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 then I say, and um, and then the crowd cheered, right? So now you're convinced that it, well, what the meaning of bat is. So as the context unfolds. Different mental images are so we, up. so we often talk about natural language recognition as the ultimate test of artificial intelligence. Is that right? Is it the hardest thing for a machine to do, or are there harder things? So I, look, there are a lot of hard things to do, um, uh, but I think this that is the one that you decided you were going to focus your life on. This is the one, this is the one that really kind of gets at the heart of it, in my opinion, yeah. because this deals with with human meaning, is humans assign meaning to the things around us. The only time we're gonna to get to be able to communicate fluently with computers, if they can start to make similar, make the connections, right, that we do with language. So you were focused on this field, and then a few years ago, someone came up with a bright idea with an IBM, let's play Jeopardy. How did that come about? What right. happened there? Right. Well, so that wasn't your idea, right? That it wasn't. It wasn't my idea to play play Jeopardy. I, I, I because of my uh, interests and the team I had built and the things I had been doing at that point for years, I was in a unique position to to work on it, to respond to it, to want to. So do you it. so you did the hard, you knew the hardware systems. You did the, you'd done the software architecture. Software architecture and, and the, engineering. We we invested in. Um, infrastructure, basically software mm -hmm. programs that allowed you to build systems like Watson for some time, invested in the skills, the talents, and people um, on my team in, uh, in natural language processing and knowledge representation and reasoning, another part of AI, and in information retrieval uh, and machine learning. All these people were there largely because, um, you know, I was collecting people of similar interests and focus o over over, over a decade. Mm -hmm. you know, but, but why Jeopardy? So what happened with Jeopardy was um, Deep, Deep Blue, the computer that played chess, was, was a great success for IBM. And the executives were looking for, you know, what's the really, what's the next big thing? You know, they what, wanted what, to show off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
an opportunity to show off, no, an, an mm -hmm. opportunity to, to kind of advance the science mm -hmm. in a way that would bring attention, that would kind of, you know, wow and, and, and get the general audience to scratch their heads and go, what does this mean? This is really cool. What's going on? So they're looking, you know, what's the next thing you could do? And uh, it was Charles Lickel was, uh, was a VP at IBM who was actually in a restaurant. He was one of the people thinking about what would be the next thing. And all of a sudden, everyone in the restaurant got up, went into the bar, and they were all fixated on the television. And it was Ken Jennings playing Jeopardy during his winning streak. So he was there. So he was there. And so he thought, um, so Charles Lickle thought, gee, you know, this could be pretty exciting. Can we get a computer to play, to play Jeopardy? But this was an executive, not a scientist. This was someone who didn't right. quite understand what that really meant. Right. And then right. he came to you and said, fix right. this. Not, nothing of executives. They're brilliant, <laughs> pay my salary, and I love them. But, um, no, uh, no, I think, right, so, no, he was not a person who understood this kind of technology. He, he was really, you know, sort of person who sat there and said, this would be, can we get, can we get a computer to solve? This would be a, a cool challenge to do. And how did that go down when he came up with that bright idea? So um, he, he talked to other executives about it. They actually, a few of them thought it was good. A few of them thought it was crazy. Um, but then it was uh, shopped around, in other words, um, the execs went around to a lot of the researchers and were looking for someone who thought that it could be do, that it could be done, someone who thought it was possible and uh, who would kind of stand up to the task. And um, there was no one around for a couple of years. Um, I was interested, but there were a lot of naysayers. They're like, you know, this is just, you'll never do this, you're gonna fail, it's pure folly, you're gonna destroy your career, blah, blah, blah. And I was still busy with, um, with the, the other stuff I was doing, the unstructured information management architecture, you know, the sort of the foundation for building systems like this. And, um, and so um, around the end of 2006, I said, look, I'm so interested in this. Let me um, put together a few guys um, and see if, uh, do a feasibility study. And in a few months, I'll come back and I'll say, look, I, I think this could be done. Um, I think it's absolutely impossible. Just g give me a chance to just make an informed decision about this because I'm excited about it. I think it can be done. Let me, let me argue it. You know, give me some time to argue why. So I did that and made the case. And um, you know, the executive support, you know, at that point, were, were willing to support it and, and take it forward. Now, even, even then, though, nobody still, many, many people thought, you know, this was going to fail. My, it was just a matter of time before they were going to bury me in a closet somewhere, and that well, would be... Yeah. I mean, even now, you talk to people in the field of artificial intelligence, and they say, I was talking to Rodney Brooks at MIT, and he said, you know, if you go back five years and ask people how long would it take to be able to do this, they'd have said, 20 years, 30 years, I mean, certainly not a five-year horizon. But when you, when you decided, this is it, I'm going to bet everything and go for this, what, what, did you, what, what odds did you give yourself of achieving it in... What was it, a three-year time frame? I mean, it was a quick So quick what, I, thing. What, what, you know, in all fairness, I mean, I, I, what I told um, the execs was I'd be able to do this in three to five years. Um, I kind of made that up. Uh, <laughs> I got lucky. I thought if it was more, as, if as it was, there was no way I could do it in less than three, not, not ever. And if I said more than five, I probably wouldn't have gotten the funding. So... <laughs> Three to five whether it was the right answer. Um, we did it in four. Um, so, look, I mean, the way, the way I, I saw it was um, I didn't know exactly what the odds wa were. Uh, I had an intuition that, you know, given what we knew about the technology, given, you know, I had a team working in question answering, working in, in natural language processing, given what we knew about it, um, and given what the problem looked like, I thought we had a fighting chance. But I, th I think more importantly, I believe that it was an irresistible, absolutely irresistible challenge as far as I was concerned. In other words, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't try it. Because what I believed was that f even failure would have been more informative um, to me, to my team, and to the science than success at any, anything else I could have thought, <laughs> could I thought, you know, guaranteed success, anything else I could have thought of. So it was the kind of challenges I would even learn from people. Why, if we put the right resources and the right people and took what we believed was the right approach to the problem and we failed, 
We, we would have something important to say. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about it now. We then. wouldn't. So let's, let's we face wouldn't, it. but Noble I would, failure st I would not feel work. good still. Believe, no, you don't believe oh. that. <laughs> well, let's, well, let's talk about exactly what it is you did. I mean, we got deep QA behind us mm. up on the, on the screen here. Um, so uh, you started out by basically amassing uh, a lot of, well, 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 your team, first of all, was, as you say, was, you know, was a team you've been building up for a while. How big was it? How many people did you have? What kind of skills did they have? So when we, st when we started off, it was about 12, about 12 people. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, we had computational uh, linguists, um, information retrieval, knowledge representation and reasoning, machine learning, um, uh, so software engineering and architecture. So we had a, a quite a variety of, of talent and skills in there, and I think that diverse set was important. Um, and, and that's sort of what we started with. Over, we started growing, um, so over the, uh, the four years, you know, we grew ultimately to about 26, 27 people uh, total, uh, because at some point we had to, once the machine sort of got good enough at answering the questions, uh, it was taking, so we, we kept driving accuracy. In other words, our ability to answer a question accurately, but also to compute an accurate confidence. One of the really sort of important challenges in Jeopardy, you kind of have to know what you know. You just can't say, oh, here's, an, here's my top head, I don't know. And you know, get it wrong, you lose a dollar value associated with the clue, your competitors chime in, you're in trouble. So computing an accurate probability that the answer was correct was actually very important. So the, the metrics we were driving was the ability to answer a lot of questions but all, uh, correctly, but also to be able to predict if your answer was likely right or wrong. And so when you see the game, you'll see that answer panel. And what that answer panel tells you is what its top three answers are and what its probability was. Mm -hmm. So we kept, we kept driving those numbers, but at some point, we got it to look like we were getting there, it looked like we were moving, we were gonna able to do this, we were gonna get accurate enough and predict probabilities well enough that we might be able to play this game, and it was taking two hours to answer a single question. <laughs> Whereas the Jeopardy producers kept telling us it would be a very boring game, and <laughs> so, um, so that's when we had to grow the team. We brought people on who, uh, who specialized in, um, Optimi optimizing the system. So in other words, so that we can start scaling the system out over not just one computer, but over what ended so up being... So just bringing masses of power to mass on a single yeah. point in time. So what ended up being 2,880 cores. Um, this is not an economic way to play a game. And win 2,800. Well, you know, you say that, and um, that's true, I guess. But you look at what your comparison. You know, we wanted to... So Watson had to be completely self-contained, right? So just a human can't connect to anything and look anything up or talk to his cousin or anything. So, you know, Watson had to be completely self-contained, was not connected to anything at all. And when you compare, you know, what happened, talking about efficiency, the human brain, like, powered by what, a tuna fish sandwich, a glass of water, uses about 20 watts. Um, Watson was the equivalent of 10 refrigerators. It used 80 kilowatts, 20 tons of air conditioning, uh, so, yeah, so, so the human brain so, is more So efficient. pound for pound, the humans are still in front. Oh, yeah, you yeah. betcha. <laughs> so, so what is, what is deep... At that task. <laughs> so, so what is deep QA? How, how actually does it work? So deep QA is the underlying architecture that Watson's built on top of. So it's, you know, the, as, as many computer systems are, it's sort of very layered. So, you know, you have the, you know, the hardware, um, which was the, the IBM Power 750s, 2,880 cores of them, uh, 15 terabytes of RAM. Uh, and on top of that was um, this other system that my team had built the four, year, uh, four, four or five years previous, what we called UIMA or UIMA, the Unstructured Information Management Architecture. This was kind of like the plumbing that allowed you to plug in many different algorithms and connect them together. So there was that. And then on top of that, we built QA, which was the architecture that ultimately, you know, Watson was built on. And that's the, the brains, if you will, of the, of the Jeopardy contestant, you know, Watson. And the way it would work is when a question comes in, so it has a topic, uh, a category, and it comes in, and Watson tries to sort of understand it. And when I say understand, I don't mean the way humans understand it, because when you get language, you start connecting it to your, your experiences, your memories, your, your, you know, your mental images, and so forth. Um, the computer gets in you know, text and parses it. 
So what I mean by parse is like when you were in uh, high school or grammar school, you would diagram a sentence. What's the subject? What's the verb? What's the object? Prepositional phrase, object of the preposition, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so, Watson, so Watson would do that, so you know, get that parse. And then it would try to understand what, sort of what the words mean. Are there people in here, organizations in here, places, times, and how are they related? So it gets an interpretation of the question. And, and it's just looking at words in context. And it's just looking at words in context of, of, of the question. It has algorithms that look at cues, that try to assign semantics, like this looks like a name. This looks like the name of a person. This looks like the name of a place. This looks like a time or a date. So it has those kinds of what we call semantics, like you know, they would apply to that. But then it would come up with lots of different interpretations because it wasn't exactly sure. So it, it, from there, it would generate different queries. So one of the principal ideas here was that because computers don't have a, a meaningful command of, of language the way we do, um, there was like no moment that we, we expect it really understood anything. It was generating possibilities and then gathering more and more data and figuring out which one of those possibilities were going to make sort of be the most supported by the data. So it's the way to think about it. So it would take the question, it would generate different interpretations of the question, it would fire out many, many queries, and it would bring back documents and passages from the things that it read a priori, right? From encyclopedias, from dictionaries, from thesauri, from scripts, from plays, from, from books. It would bring out back all these pages and documents and paragraphs and passages and um, that might have something to do with the question. And then from there, it would generate possible answers. Like it would try to read them and say, well, this might be an answer, that might be an answer. So, so now it would have like, you know, let's say 100 possible answers. And then it would, each one was sort of like a competing hypothesis. So Watson will say, well, okay, so maybe George Washington's the answer, or maybe Christopher Columbus is the answer, or maybe Vasco da Gama is the answer, maybe. So we have a hundred of these possible answers. And then for each one, it would say, okay, now it's gonna to try to gather enough evidence to prove that that was the right answer. So now let's say you had a hundred possible, uh, possible answers. For each one, it may, let's say, went out and gathered a hundred pieces of evidence. So other documents and passages and facts that might support, you know, Vasco da Gama or Christopher Columbus as the answer. But these were kind of independent threads. So it's kind of competing hypotheses go out. And then, so now if I had 100 answers and 100 pieces of evidence, that's 10,000 answer evidence pairs. And then it would have, we have all these algorithms, algorithms that the researchers have developed over, over the years. Uh, that we're working on the project, you know, to analyze the evidence, like analyze that paragraph or that document, that fact, and come up with a, an estimation that that evidence supported that answer. Oh, I'm reading something here about Vasco da Gama. It says Vasco da Gama, you know, landed in, in Capit Beach, and the question's asking about arriving in India. Oh, I, that looks like it's related. So this is, looks like it's good evidence because, you know, I have this other thing about Christopher Columbus thinking he was in India. And in this, right, so that's maybe some evidence for Christopher Columbus. So we do this for 100 possible answers, 100 algorithms. Now you have millions of what we call scores, confidences, numbers between 0 and 1 that say, I, you know, 50% chance, you know, 0.5 chance that this evidence supports this answer is the right answer. So a million of these scores. So now you've got to combine them all, and at the end you get a rank list of answers where each answer has a probability associated with it, like 60%. So if that probability was over a threshold, say 50%, say, Watson would want to answer. If the probability was below a threshold, again, say 50%, Watson would say, I don't want. But this, uh, all of this sounds, forgive me, but it sounds like your bat coming through the window. It's the way the human brain works when you're trying to work out context, probability, you're looking for more information, you're weighing up various scenarios before you, and then, maybe you're only 60% sure it was a fruit bat rather than a cricket bat. Right. So isn't this the way the human brain works? And is, are there any direct parallels here that you were Well, we certainly, you modeling? know, when we started the project, we certainly didn't start out thinking um, we're going to model a human brain. Uh, we really approached it as engineers. You know, how do you solve this task? And we had people talented in all these areas of computer science, not cognition. So we didn't have neuroscientists, we didn't have cognitive psychologists. Um, but when, we, when you reflect on how it worked, you would see these analogies. You would think, well, gee, I mean, I don't know about you know, how a brain is organized physiologically and, and you know, neurons and so forth, but what I could tell you is that I'm conscious of a similar procedure. 
So you know, the computer is using a similar procedure that you might be conscious of that you use when you answer these questions. And, that, and, that, and that, you know, that's fair. And there are times when we would think, we look at a question and say, you know, it's not getting this right, and we would think, how would a human do this? Right? But we're not thinking about how does a brain work necessarily, but what procedure are Logic we conscious process. of you know, when yeah. we do this? Yeah. So um, the, other, the other aspects of this, of course, were you know, obviously a massive amount of data that you could subject your system, you could pump through your system to test. Right. Machine learning sort of right. feedback loops to learn from it and move it on. I mean, it sounds like you, know, you had a whole lot of different advances coming together at the same time that made this possible. Simply wouldn't have been possible five years before. Well, I, th I, I think there are quite a, yeah, a number of things. I mean, massive parallelism and the power of the computers itself. Mm -hmm. um, the access to large amounts of data that we were able to use to have the machine trained. This goes back to this notion of can we acquire knowledge from naturally occurring? Can we acquire and interpret um, language? Can we reason over naturally occurring knowledge? What I mean by naturally occurring knowledge is the stuff that humans generate to communicate. You know, we produce knowledge by the droves. Right? We're prolific. So um, did you go out on the web and crawl for yeah, information? So, well, we, and we just had encyclopedias. I mean, some stuff could. was open source, stuff from the web, uh, encyclopedias, dictionaries, the Sorai books, plays, scripts, the Bible, Shakespeare. Um, you know, the, yeah, all that stuff was in there. The equivalent of about um, not uh, equivalent of about a million books or so. But then we would um, pro you know we would process it and generate you know more what we call metadata, so the computer would analyze and so forth. It's not a lot of information on web scale, interestingly enough, right? I mean, I think the roughly it was about the raw content was around 100 gigabytes. Um, you know, the web is petabytes. I mean, it's just you know it's. But on a human scale, it's an enormous amount of information, right? Can you imagine sort of having access to a million books, right? I mean, so, yeah. um, and when, when we say, when I say the computer Watson is 15 terabytes, that's 15 terabytes of RAM. So it used 15 terabytes of, of working memory to analyze and understand and do that process I was describing earlier. It wasn't 15 terabytes of raw content. It was only about 100 gigabytes of raw content. All right. So, um, before we talk about some of the implications of this, of what you've achieved, I, I do have one, one question about Watson I've been wondering about is, you know, does it have an unfair advantage um, on buzzer speed? Because I, I can't believe I could press a buzzer as fast as a machine could press a buzzer. You so, can't. You know, are there, are there you angles here that you're Jennings, able to but, manipulate? But you can't, but Ken Jennings can. Really? So actually, really, and here's um, why. So, um, so technically speaking, um, if you're a complete sort of level playing field, yeah, a computer's reaction speed is, 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 is faster, certainly. Um, now, the idea behind putting a computer up and playing Jeopardy was, you know, you have a computer review human, they both have their you know, pros and cons, they both have their strengths and weaknesses, but the interface to the game uh, should be functionally equivalent. So um, the, the, uh, the human had to press a, a, a handheld buzzer so did the computer. So we actually had to build a little hand and... No. Yeah, did seriously. All right. It doesn't look like a hand. It looked, right. it looked like, you know, a sol it looked like a solenoid switch with a plunger. And All right, but we'll trust you on this one. So there was no cheating there. Any other No, no, area? wait, no, wait. I, I, I mean, I didn't finish, but I'm happy to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, no. Uh -huh. So... Um, so you know, it would actually push the button. It would push the button down. But even with that mechanical device, it was you know still uh, faster than a, a human's reaction time. But what happens? What humans can do is um, they would anticipate. So what really good Jeopardy the professional you know Jeopardy players are extraordinary on the buzz. In fact, Ken Jennings was amazing, right? I mean, his, his he um, he outbuzzed basically all his competitors. His you know average take on a board. What I mean by take is like how many of the questions you got to answer first. His average take was 62% of a game. His average. He did 70, he did 81% take. This is because he's clobbering them on the buzz. Um, and, you know, so we brought Ken Jennings' game to Ken Jennings, um, where, you know, we had, a, now, now, did it mean that we couldn't lose the buzz? Absolutely not. And, and in fact, we did lots of trials with humans. And what Ken did, and what, human, what good human players do, is they listen to the, the speech, listen to Alex speak, and then they time it. So they, they anticipate when the buzz is going to be enabled. 
And they do that remarkably well. So we time them coming in in the single digit milliseconds, four milliseconds, two milliseconds, wow. right, right, right on the nose. So we couldn't get into this game without being, because once you could do the question answering, once you could do the buzzing, once you could do the probability stuff, then, I'm sorry, once you could do all that other stuff, then you need to be, you need to be able to compete on the buzz. So we couldn't come, come in with this expectation, oh, humans took 200 milliseconds. Absolutely not, you know, absolutely not true. So we had to get that speed so that when that question came in and um, Watson had to compute its answer and its confidence fast enough to be able to get in there um, and, and compete with, with the humans. Uh, and now humans, you know, weren't as consistent. In other words, they couldn't come in in you know, single-digit milliseconds very often, but they could do it. Watson's advantage was that it was more consistent. It could consistently come in you know, quickly. Mm -hmm. Watson lost the buzz a bunch of times. In fact, it, um, its take on the final games was around the same things, like 61 or 62%. Its take, in terms of how many questions it answers first, in that game against Ken and Brad was Ken's average. So there's a lot of technique here. There's a lot of buzz technique oh, yeah, into this. Bet. So yeah. So yeah. the humans might still come ahead on intelligence. Oh, they. Be, uh, well, yeah. the humans. No, no. The humans come ahead in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Well, let's let's talk about some of the implications and uses of what you've done here. Um, first by, of all, by the way, humans huh? built Watson. Just want to point that out. Well, I'll we'll talk about some of the implications <laughs> of that maybe. But um, first of all, in terms of games, so. Uh, Chess has now succumbed to computers. Natural language games have succumbed to computers. What, what's next? What about poker bots, for instance? Poker? I mean, poker. Have that? Well, they they have played that pretty already. well. Machines played pretty well, but humans still can out bluff a machine, right? In poker. I mean, are there any other games that you have an eye on or you think uh, would be a real challenge for a machine? I'm out, of the game. I'm out of the game business. You're out of the game I, business. I, I tried to convince IBM that we could generate revenue stream by winning at Jeopardy, <laughs> but no. Um, but no, no other I'm big not. challenges, no other big challenges in games. I, I, there might be. I mean, I haven't put a lot of thought into it, but I mean, I, I, that's not where we, let me, let me just, we, that's not where we want to take Watson, right. I think. So, uh, real life applications, you're already taking it into healthcare. Yes. So, how is it different from those expert systems you were talking about before? Should we think about it in the same sort of terms, yeah, just so a little smarter? So I get very excited about this because I think it's, it's, it has a lot of the promise that I think the expert systems that we imagined in, in the 80s had, but it's different in such an important and fundamental way. So we meant, what we mean by expert systems is computer systems that kind of can reason um, you know, over, over knowledge. So they could sit there and say, well, you know, I'm observing this, and based on what I know, here's, my, you know, here's what the solution might be, or here's what the right next action might be, or whatever. So they could you know, think in that way, right? They could reason. But, Reasoning over this structured knowledge was a problem because it was hard to capture and maintain a mathematization of an entire domain. Imagine sitting there and trying to encode every, you know, all the models that represented, you know, medicine and all the rules and all the mathematical axioms. I mean, it's, it's just very, very, very hard to do. So the promise of Watson is that it can reason over unstructured information. So it could reason over language. It could reason over knowledge in the form that humans are creating it. So if humans, are, humans don't naturally mathematize knowledge for a computer, what they do naturally do is they write textbooks, they write papers, um, they write articles, they report in their results, you know, um, they write about their experiences. This is what they do very naturally in natural language. So if we can get a computer to reason over natural language, now we have something that can scale. I mean, by scale is that it could start to do a lot of useful things without a lot of work on our part. We do our thing, which is to write stuff in natural language, and then let computers do their thing over that natural language. It will never perform in the same way that we expected expert systems to perform. Expert systems were extremely precise, right? They would do a, a, an exact rule. If there was a circular rash and it needed exactly a circular rash, and then it would tell you exactly what to do. And so they're very precise. Um, and, and they could do long, long chains of reasoning. So if you asked it why, it would show you like a 5,000 line deductive proof. That wouldn't be very useful to you, but you might sit there and say, well, must have thought a lot. What, what, we, what we want Watson to do is deliver explanations in, in your words, in the words of humans. So in other words, we want it to say, here's why 
I think it's, here's why it might be Lyme disease, and here's why it might be arthritis. And my explanation is not a precise 5,000 line deductive proof. My explanation are these following pieces of information from these references. If you read this and then read this and read this, you'll know exactly why I was more confident, I being the computer, was more confident in Lyme disease than arthritis. So you're bringing an explanation to the human, to the decision maker, based on you know, nat natural language content in their own terms. So this is a very, very different way of thinking, is getting the computer to reason over natural language content. One of the, one of the questions that someone has submitted here is very much along these lines. So medical students spend the first two years studying sciences, anatomy, and so on, and the organic chemistry that you are so keen on. So uh, the question is, why can't we encode all that knowledge once and for all and create a, medic a basic medical diagnostic system and a smart medical training system that would simply so, so it's a great, it's a great question, and the reality yeah. is that there are many um, diagnostic expert systems today that, um, by some measures, by quantitative measures, perform as well as doctors. They predict as well as doctors do. They're not, uh, they have not been widely adopted, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, but one of the primary ones is that they, it's very hard to keep them current. They're very narrow. They work in that one field where you wrote, wrote the rules for. Um, and then um, that's it. You know, kind of keeping them up to date and current requires a dramatic effort. And their explanations, you know, why they're coming up with these answers are these very static rules. And they don't give you the context. They don't give you the source. They don't, they don't let you as a human really judge the evidence. They assume that that's it. You know, somebody wrote it as a rule must be right. But the reality is that evidence is changing all the time. There's context around that. You need to give the human the opportunity, in my, in my view, to process and understand the original, the original information to make a judgment. We don't want to take judgment away from humans. We want to enable better judgment. To enable better judgment, we need to provide explanations and, and uh, the content that convinces them, that's ultimately persuasive. Right, because the doctor, or a combination of the doctor and the other caregivers, the patients, ultimately have to make the judgments. We want to give them the information that they can be confident in. So I think these prior systems are brittle, narrow. They don't give you the kind of information you're comfortable with, ultimately. So which, so which are the fields of, of knowledge where that approach works? Medicine, obviously. Law? Uh, which others? You know, which, which areas are on your checklist of places to go with Watson? So I, th I, think, I think healthcare, medicine, I think is, is certainly one. I think law is possible. Law is, I think, brings its own challenges. Um, I think, um, you know, we talk, about, um, we talk about finance, but not in the traditional way, you know, not, not transaction processing systems, not trading systems, but rather, you know, can Risk I- Risk management. Yeah, uh, or, or services. You know, can I understand what's a good product or not, depending on a set of criteria and think, you know, things like that. So again, at any time you're, you're exploring possibilities and you know that there may be different alternatives, different options, and you, you want to evidence those options. And you want to evidence those options from a body of, of mostly natural, you know, combination of structured and unstructured knowledge. You talk about this as uh, a way of, of uh, making human decisions more informed and supporting humans. Um, and yet, quite naturally, it raises fears amongst people about what it'll do to their jobs. Um, so it may well be that I would trust a machine ultimately to make a smarter decision than my doctor in terms of a diagnostic choice. Um, how do you see this? Um, does this replace jobs? So for instance, you, know, you can imagine there are all kinds of areas where we welcome it if it did replace human beings in lots of customer support areas, it would be wonderful to have an intelligent agent that responded to you and gave you the answers you wanted, you know, without are those you awful the decision trees. Are you saying the current agents are not intelligent? Are well, um, so, you know, I'm not saying it's all bad here. I mean, we, it would improve the quality of our lives, but what, what will it do to information jobs, to white collar jobs uh, that haven't really had to compete with machine intelligence before? I think in general, it, what, the trend we see with, with technology always is causing transitions, causing change. I think that's, that's not new, right? As we develop more and more you know, newer and new technologies that perform these various tasks, there's always a transition 
uh, that, you know, that we go through. But ultimately, I think humans figure out how to assimilate a technology. Technology doesn't assimilate us. And a lot of people, you know, used to say, oh, Watson, next thing, Skynet, you know, take over the world, we're all gonna get eaten by computers. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I well, don't. Well, but you're, you're making a leap there, which we don't necessarily need to make. We can take this one step at a time before we get to Skynet. Um, if, for instance, how do, we, how do we audit or monitor the quality of the output of a machine like Watson? If we're gonna use it for decision support, how do we know ultimately that you know this is value, really valuable information? So that's great. So great. So you know, is it adding value? Um, mm -hmm. And I think the way, the way to the one way to judge that is ultimately um, are humans using it? Are <laughs> they finding it useful? Um, I mean, if you talk about healthcare, I, which is kind of largely where my mind is at, I I don't expect Watson to be making um, I don't expect Watson to be making the decision. I expect the physician the caregiver team to be making the decisions, to be making the judgments. I don't believe that you, could, you can take, especially in healthcare, I don't believe you could ever be taking that away mm -hmm. from the humans. What you want the computer to do is inform them, is to ensure that they are considering all the options, that they have access to the best evidence in support of those things, that, um, that the computer helps them collaborate in sort of an informed way, uh, bringing the information they need together. How do you judge it? Is it being used? When you, when you look at the history of human and computer interaction, that seems somewhat idealistic. If you look at the recent history of the financial sector, for instance, where you know, that's a sector that's invested very heavily in risk management right. systems, trading support systems, right. and some of the most advanced systems in the world. And yet, um, what that leads to is an undue reliance or confidence in um, models that are ultimately unsound. So although you say, you know, th these are wonderful systems that can support us, actually that isn't what experience has taught us so far. So, I mean, when you think about systems like that, I mean, you're, so they're, ma they're making certain decisions and they're taking action often on those decisions and those um, models are ultimately not accessible, right? I mean, the people who built them understand them. I think what we're trying to do with Watson is, in, in fact, people often make this, sort of have this misconception about Watson from a statistical versus rule-based technique. So I, I say, you know, Watson is not rule-based in that traditional expert system way. And people immediately jump to this notion that it's statistical and that what it's doing is it's looking at patterns, like let's say in the case of healthcare, it's looking at your electronic medical record. And based on looking at many of them, it sees a pattern that says, oh, here's what your diagnosis is. And there's no explanation. That's not what we're doing with Watson. That's not the expected role of Watson. What Watson is doing is connecting that input information to possible outcomes, possible diagnoses, or possible treatments. And what it's doing is providing you the, a chain of explanations based on sources of human knowledge. So you're going to sit there and you're going to see that and you're going to say, yes, that's the information I needed to make that judgment. That's a very different interaction than letting a computer independently make a judgment and not even having an understanding of why because it was a closed statistical model. And you know, this is kind of getting into the, the pros and cons of some of this stuff, of the, of the actual techniques that we imagine. But what I imagine here is producing a body of knowledge that would persuade a human, yeah, this looks like the right thing to do. Hmm. One well, question from the audience here. Um, do you have any plans for using this in education? Can you visit it? So education? education, I didn't mention education earlier, but it's, it's one of the areas that are particularly exciting for me. Um, right now, you know, we can't do everything all at once, but there, there is some, um, some effort and some thoughts into uh, how Watson can be used in, in uh, helping in reading comprehension and critical thinking. And I think that's a very interesting and sort of unique opportunity um, where you know, you, you're, you're taking one of the strengths that Watson has, which is you know, reasoning over natural language text, and you could imagine having an, a tutoring system that can work with the student and here, read this article, answer these questions. What do you want to, you know, how do you find the answer? How do you make the connections? What questions do you ask to get evidence that that answer is correct? So it's kind of a neat thing. I, I don't know, 
I, you know, I don't know um, how profitable it would be ultimately, and I don't know whether people, you know, would pick up on it. But I could tell you it would be a really cool thing. Um, you know, thinking about the Turing, you know, the Turing test we were talking about earlier, um, I can imagine a tutoring system that was we wouldn't have to script it. We would just say, here, the student's going to read the article. You know, you read the article. Here are the questions. Help the student answer the questions. You know, um, ask them follow-up questions. Uh, ask them what their reasoning chain is and answer them as you go. And I, I think that's kind of a, really, a unique opportunity to apply the technology. What about uh, applications in defense and intelligence? We know that you know, that's where a lot of the most advanced applications are for new technologies. Are you working with Homeland Security, with the Department of Defense? Can you talk well, about that? Even them? if I were, I couldn't tell you. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but you can wink. But, <laughs> <laughs> but are there, ob there are obvious applications no, you know, total information you know, awareness? I, I think, I, you know, any, any, any area where having a deeper understanding of what's out there in this natural language content um, is going to give you an advantage is an area where there's going to be interest. Um, so. I'll we'll take that as a yes then. <laughs> I'm going to go, we're going to rush through some questions here on the cards. Sure. Um, how, does, what, how does Watson compare with Siri, Apple's Siri? So we've seen, you know, one of the amazing things about artificial intelligence seems to be that the, the, the hardest things, natural language recognition, facial recognition, are all suddenly we're seeing applications on our smartphones. Siri is one, but Android now with ice cream sandwich can, re can use facial recognition to yeah. unlock the phone. These are things that a few years ago we thought were pretty difficult to do, and now they're in our pocket. Um, but what, what do you think of those sort of applications, and how, they, how do they compare? So first, uh, first of all, I mean, I think you're going to see more and more of that stuff, and this, and, and this is largely because of the advance in machine learning techniques where we're learning how to train the computer. This is going back to this trade-off that I mentioned earlier. You know, we don't, to get a computer to recognize images, to recognize voice, we don't, or speech, we don't put in rules anymore, right? We train them, we expose them to data, and we say, correct, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. And using statistical machine learning, it's uh, over time, the, the machine learns how to separate uh, the, you know, the correct response from the wrong response, and it trains what we call trains a model, and that model can now allow it to detect what you, what you exposed it to. So if you keep saying, you know, this is a hat, you know, we show images of things. This is a hat, this is a car, this is a hat, this is a car. Right, over time it starts, and, and it can see all the pixels and the colors, and it could detect certain shapes and stuff. And it starts to learn that, oh, I could see what differentiates a hat from a car, right? So it starts getting better, better at classifying things. And, you, and, and that's a powerful technology that we're just, you know, just starting to really tap into. And so you're gonna see more and more of the capability of the machine being able to detect these patterns using the statistical machine learning technique. Um, so, so I think, you know, those are, example, those are examples is, of that. Is, is Siri for real or is it a gimmick? Is it a parlor trick? So Siri, Siri has, you know, pretty uh, good voice recognition where mm -hmm. it uses this kind of the machine learning technology. In terms of answering questions, it's, it's very different. I mean, it's, it's sort of not really apples, uh, it's kind of an apples and oranges sort of thing. When, um, where, we, where we want to go with, you got that pun, did you? So, um, so what, you know, wh where we want to go with Watson is sort of high value uh, questions where you're providing sort of an explanation so you're, you're getting into the space where, you know, I have a bunch of different alternatives. And so and that, that's kind of interesting. When you look at Jeopardy, right, you see this question and answer out. And you think that's where we're going with Watson. And it's, it, that's, it's just a demonstration. The technology underneath is generating many, many hypotheses, gathering and scoring evidence. And that's really where we're going with the technology, is can we help people gather relevant evidence, organize it, correlate it, score it, assess it, and, and provide you know, this decision support capability. So that's really the direction that that is going, not sort of looking things up in an, FA, in an FAQ. But a lot of people make, you know, they, don't, they don't realize there's such a big difference. One of, the, one, of the first, one of the first interviews I had when we announced this, a radio show host was a live interview. He says, let me get this straight. You put the answers into the computer and with the questions, and then when the clue shows up on the board, Watson just speaks out the answer, right? I was like, no, we don't. Not only don't we know the answers, we don't even know what the questions are going to be ahead of time. 
So the guy says, well, then how are you going to do it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let's, let's, um, so it's not an FAQ database. Go ahead. Well, all right, here's another one. Will we someday be able to tell our computers what we want them to do without having to write text-based programs? You didn't use speech recognition for Watson, right? It was we text. did not. You know, we Why did. not? We didn't use, so we didn't use voice recognition in Watson because, because it was, the, the natural language question answering problem was such a big enough nut to crack um, that we really wanted to make this challenge about that. And um, had we brought in, and it would have been cool, frankly, to bring in the whole enchilada, right? Uh, to have the robot with the vision and the voice recognition and all that stuff. It would have been cool. But it would have um, masked uh, the accomplishment around the core problem that we were focused on, which is the natural language question answering. So we said, you know what? Right. Um, and Jeopardy had made these kinds of allowances before for blind contestants and so forth. So we were like, OK. Um, no images, and you know we're not going to be listening from a speech recognition perspective. Oh. Uh, a couple of questions here on whether, you know, very long term, you see artificial intelligence in the Turing sense, in the sense of human understanding. Um, is that a long term goal still, or a, a long term endpoint? And if so, how do we? You know, I, I personally, I think different people have different impressions of this, and and you know, and I can imagine different research threads, and I could support them. I, I personally am a lot more sort of task based. I like to get, you know, we have a problem we need to solve. You know, let's 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 figure out how to do. You know, let's figure out how to get the computer to to solve its problem to add value, not just to mimic humans for the oh. sake of mimicking humans. Um, you know, other, other research agendas might think differently. I, I have that personal slant toward things. I think that ultimately we'll find that um, having um, passing the Turing test will say more about humans than it will about the computer behind the curtain, frankly. It'll say, you know, what does it take to fool a human that there's another human behind the curtain? I'm, I, my GPS wow. fools some people, so it, uh, you know. Are we is there some exponential increase in computing power here that's going to help you push further down that road? So, you know, we've said a few times, if you go back a few years, this would have seemed impossible to many people. We have questions here about quantum computing and other techniques. You know, is there, uh, can you see some acceleration of technological development now that's going to push this much faster? So, this is probably bad interview etiquette, but let me just go back to the, the question just before, because one thing I wanted to say about um, you know, pursuing this notion of mimicking you know, humans and human thinking, um, there's, there's value in that, because I, it was hit on the last point I was making about the Turing test, because I think we learn a lot about ourselves when we do that, and I don't want to discount that. We learn a, a lot about our, our own intelligence, and we learn about our own thought processes when we, when, we exp when we take that direction. You know, how does the human mind work? Um, how do we think? Can we get computers to do the same thing? And every time we try that, we learn something new about ourselves. I don't want to discount that. At the same time, you know, my per personal thing is I'd like to you know, build systems that solve particular tasks. But you know, back to uh, yeah, the point about where things are going. You know, what's the, um, so I think there are some really interesting things on the horizon right now that will accelerate. Uh, the, you know, I, I, we talked about just the availability of large volumes of knowledge that the computer can train on. I think part of the reason we approached uh, machine intelligence through these rules was largely because we never even, um, there just wasn't petabytes of natural language in electronic form that we could even imagine we'd be able to, you know, uh, create algorithms to learn over them. It just wasn't available. That's available now. Just tons and tons of information that we can use these statistical machine learning techniques to start to look at these words or phrases might be the same thing because I've looked at a million examples of their usage and I see similar context around them. They seem to have the same types of objects and the same types of subjects, and they seem to be surrounded by the same types of other concepts, so maybe they mean the same thing. Let me test that hypothesis out. And, and now we could learn this by looking at tons and tons of data rather than me telling it. And Watson uses some of that. So machine learning and, and, the, and the availability of large volumes of content. Machine translation. How many people have used the translators on the web and stuff? I mean, you know, that's 
That's happening because of availability of huge amounts of training data and statistical machine learning techniques, the I, image recognition. I realize this is jumping over a few steps along yeah. the way here, but does this lead ultimately to machine, the machines designing the next generation of machines, which is something that a lot of people around the valley talk about? Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not, do. I'm not imagining that. Uh, I'm not imagining. Doesn't machine learning lead to that ultimately? Those feedback loops? No. Um, a pained expression on your face there. Maybe that's the problem. Question. Yeah, because I'm thinking about how I'm going to answer this in one minute and 51 seconds. Um, <laughs> not, not so much. Not so much. But it's, it, that's, that's a fine answer. But, it, but I think you know, what, we're, what we're hitting here is what, what often comes up when you discuss artificial intelligence, which is uh, working out where the far horizon is and where the near horizon is. And what's often surprising in this field is how things that seem difficult seem to, yeah. seem to be hit as milestones. And yet the really big things, well, are they beyond the horizon or are they there within reach? I mean, how do you feel about well, that? Well, yeah, great examples, you know, what's going on with sort of the, you know, the, the automated uh, unmanned vehicles, you know, with cars, planes, right. I mean, it's remarkable, right? Drive you know, across the desert without a, you know, without a human in there, cars are parking themselves and maneuvering themselves in traffic. I mean, that's huge, right? We would never imagine that all of a sudden happening. And that's really remarkable. At the same time, we're still struggling you know, with natural language. You're still struggling getting computers to dialogue fluently with us. Um, forget about the speech recognition, just the concept, the, you know, the fluent dialogue. I mean, that's still a ways off. Um, I, you know, if, if you were to ask me, would, would we be dialoguing fluently with the computer in the next five years? I'd say probably not. Um, will we have tools like Watson that do a better job at detecting patterns and looking for the right, you know, connections in, in text information. And yeah, will we have better image analysis? Yeah, we will. We have a computer that dialogues fluently with a human? Um, probably not. I, I think that's a, actually a very hard problem to solve. What's, final question, what's your next big rash move? <laughs> what do you want to do next? So have you, is this it now? Have you found your life's work? No, I, I, I'm not there yet. Um, I wish I was, but I, I'd love to write a book. Um, but um, no, it's, it's, I would be satisfied if, you know, I came personally, came, sort of came full circle. You know, I, I got out of be, being a uh, medical doctor. I was, in fact, I was very interested in medical expert systems and I saw this problem. And I would feel really good if we got to a point with this technology that it couldn't reason over unstructured content. It could provide really powerful decision support, you know, bring knowledge to my fingertips um, without having to hire droves of mathematicians and logicians to encode all that knowledge, but it can do it over the naturally occurring knowledge that we use to communicate. So if we could build, if Watson can reason over unstructured information, we can get expert systems to operate over unstructured information, I would, I would call it quits. Uh, so, this is, so this is about taking the, the, the building blocks you've already built and tuning it, absolutely. actually using it. Take it to it the work. next level, yeah. All right, well, Dave Ferrucci on that. Thank you very much thank indeed. You.